Hi, welcome to Quat Pod, uh, episode 39. And as you can see on screen, I'm going to welcome to Quat Pod Mr. Alex Inglethorpe uh, from wearing his Liverpool stuff. Uh, I, I think you're head of academy, is that right, Alex? Welcome yeah. on the show. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. And, and and for those that don't know, right? And I I'm going to show our age because we hope we share something in common. We were born in the same year. I've worked out through my geeky research. Um, a lot of Exeter fans probably won't realise um, the impact that you've had on Exeter City, but also your background. So I'm going to go through a little bit of your background and then start asking loads of questions. That's all right. So Exeter City manager. Uh, for about a year, uh, well, more than a year, actually, about 80, 89 games, I think. Uh, famously manager uh, of our fabled cup run with Manchester United, which uh, uh, had a real impact on uh, Exeter, as we all know. Uh, you won a Devon Bowl uh, in Plymouth. I was told to mention that quite okay. specifically by an Exeter fan. Uh, and I, I, and I, I have, I have done that, and that meant a lot at the time because we were non-league. Uh, you have uh, been a manager in multiple places, but let's start talking about your grassroots football, as I always do. So, where did you get? Where did you start your football? Where, how did you get into it? And I, I'm talking pre-Watford, yeah. Wow, seems such a long time ago. Um, I think like most kids, I've played from a fairly young age. I'm that old that the only football available to me when I was growing up was actually to be, you had to go and be a, a member of the Cubs because it was like a Cubs league. And um, I think the rule was you had to go to Cubs sort of like one every, one every three weeks to sort of like qualify for playing football. So I'm, I'm sure I sort of was on the bare minimum of that because it was the football that I was probably there for. Um, and I remember sort of, I suppose at the time, it, it, what was really good back then was you joined the Cubs when it was like nine years of age and the, the Cubs was nine to 11. And then I think you moved into the scouts so it's like, you know, after that. Yeah. So in the first year, it was always really tough because you were a nine year old playing against older boys. And then it, it got slightly easier as you, as you traveled through it. Um, so I played for them. That was my first introduction. Then local team, Fletcher Park United, Bookham Colts. Um, and then, very lucky to have a <laughs> I think as a lot of boys my generation would have had was a was a PE teacher who was a big Watford fan and he wrote into the club and said there's a lad here I think you should take a look at him um he's got something so I went down for trials at the age of 11 and stayed there to the age of 24 or 23 wow. yeah so and 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 for, again, for I know I sound we're both the same age. I know I sound a bit older. I say this for those that ne never saw you played. Uh, what would you say your um, style of play was? You were a forward. Uh, yeah, I was great at sitting on the bench. I'd mastered that one. I was fantastic at coming on and nicking <laughs> a goal. Uh, I was I was okay. I, I don't think I was. I don't think that when I retired, I was any great loss to football um, from the playing side. I was honest in terms of how I approached the game. Yeah. Um, probably lacked a little bit of belief and always felt I had to work a little bit harder than others around me, but I had a, a nice knack of being in the right place at the right time. I was never a scorer of great goals, but I would I'd, I'd find a way of getting chances. So I suppose I was, um, yeah, I, I was okay inside the 12-yard the box. Now, uh, and I, I think that's really refreshing. And I, as we I mentioned to you before we started, I've, I've done a bit of research and listened to some podcasts and obviously your work now. Now, just to put that into context, and uh, uh, I think, you know, your time at Watford, 1990 to 95 ish, it says you played 12 times and scored two goals. You then, uh, I believe, went on a loan, 1995, and you had quite a good time at Barnet, I would, I would suggest. Six appearances and three goals. That was uh, a nice little low move at the time. Yeah, it was. I think um, I think that was, it's always hard to leave your boyhood club, especially if you've been there for so long. And I kind of knew I'd, I was ready for perhaps more regular first team football. Barnet gave me the opportunity to do that. And Ray Clements was the manager at the time. 
and um, Terry Bullivan was the coach and it was Dougie Friedman up front. Um, so I was really lucky to go into a team that I felt playing good football and I, I really enjoyed my time there, really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I think played five or six games and managed to score. I think one of them was away at Exeter, I think. Um, <laughs> and then had a, a nice opportunity, I guess, to to join either Lake Orient or Barnet or a couple of other clubs after that and felt it was the right time for me to go and play a little bit more regularly. So I uh, took the opportunity to go and move to Lake Orient. And, and uh, it, it was a good move and a good time because uh, looking at it, 123 appearances, 32 goals, it says on Wikipedia. Never trust it, but uh, yeah, that, that was a good time. Who was the manager at the time? Was it Frank Clark? That was right. <laughs> no, it was off that. It was, it was Patsy Holland who was really, okay. really good for me, and then Tommy Taylor. And, you know, I transitioned from a forward into a midfielder by the time I left, so it was it was nice. You know, I think football was evolving a little bit. You know, probably when I went there, a lot of teams playing 4-4-2. Yeah. And then, you know, by the time I left, I think, you know, sort of playing three in midfield was becoming a little bit more um, prevalent. So I managed to find a, a space in there and, you know, quite an easy brief, just be honest. <laughs> Be honest in your defensive work and get in the box when there's uh, when there's any action going on. So just join in. So that that came quite naturally to me because that's probably where I wanted to spend my time anyway. So um, so I, re I really I love my time at the Oaks. I think it's um, really good really good club, special club. And um, I was there with Barry Hearn, who would just taken over. So I think I was his first signing. I think they were daft enough to pay a little bit of money for me as well. Really? So um, yeah, so I think that you know I I feel very lucky um to have been around around you know a club like that with Barry at the time because I think you know he's um he's not just a larger than life character but he's a really interesting man and he's a good man. So um yeah I feel feel lucky that my time collided with him. Cool. And then you, you had a cameo as a player at uh Exeter City that's right I think. Yeah uh, how did that come about? So, uh, and it was 19 games, two appearances. <laughs> I mean, I, I can remember you as your player, as a player, and watching you. So, okay, well, uh, lots uh, of, uh, I'm not sure that Exeter had the best of me. I, um, I, 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 again, I really enjoyed my time there. I really enjoyed living down there. I think it was a difficult season, but I learned loads from it. With um, Noel Blake was in charge. Noel, I think, Noel I, Blake. Yeah, yeah, I played against his teams when he was at Exeter as, a, as an assistant. And then I must have left enough of an impression to think that he'd want me in. I think we signed an awful lot of players that summer, so there was a bit of a, of a change. But I, I, I really enjoyed my time there. I'm disappointed that the, you know, I think we're at the wrong end of the table for most of the season. Um, but fortuitously for me, um, so I suppose Steve Perriman came in as a consultant. Yeah. I've known Steve. A little bit, you know, as a player when I was a young, young player at Watford, um, you know, he must have seen something me, me as a man because I've stayed in touch ever since. But yeah, he yeah. never played me, so it wasn't. He definitely was, didn't see much of me as a player. But he, um, you know, he must have seen something in me because we kept in touch ever since. And um, you know, when he came to to Watford, it was a nice chance after so many years for him to to see me as a as a different type actually there's a, there's a nice story with this um so <laughs> at the end of that season steve came to me and said look alex you know, i remember you previously at watford and you're a little bit of an on the shoulder type player maybe a little bit in zargi i think he was being a bit kind to me with that reference but you, you're a bit in zargi like he says i've seen this massive change where you're now playing midfield and i actually think that with better players <laughs> you see the game a little bit differently and i think given the opportunity um I think you could go, you could really sort of like kick on. So he sort of said, I'm going for a job in the Premier League. I think it was Southampton. And he said, um, if I get the job, I just want to satisfy my curiosity that I think you could play in the Premier League if you were around better players. And I was like, oh, fantastic. Wow, what an opportunity. So anyway, I'm obviously I'm sat by the phone for the whole of the summer, waiting for it to ring. Eventually, it did ring and Steve said, look, <laughs> Alex, um, I didn't get the job at Southampton. It's kind of fortuitous. I'm going back to Japan anyway. Um, I can't take you there because three foreigners, we've got three Brazilians. So unfortunately, yeah. we have to wish you all the very best. And a week later, I ended up as player manager at Leatherhead in Ryman League Division 2. Yeah. <laughs> so wow. I was, uh, 
in my own mind, I'd like to think I was that close to being a Premier League player. But do you know what? It's the best thing that ever happened. It really was. Yeah. I, so and you, said, and, you know, you, I wasn't good enough to play in the Premier League. I was barely good enough to play in League Two. But it's nice that someone saw something in you that, that perhaps you yeah. didn't. But, you know, genuinely, the best thing that happened to me was then saying, right, OK, I want to be a coach. I want to... I want to work in football. I've got to do the, the hard yards. I'd always coached throughout my career, a local team at Horsley. Um, yeah. I'd always sort of like had an interest in coaching teams. And I suppose it was a natural progression for me to, to go on. What I needed was the opportunity, which I'm very grateful for Leatherhead to have done. Very similar to Exeter, really. They were a, they were a fans-owned <laughs> club. They'd hit okay. pretty much rock bottom. Um they're on their knees. They had no money. The budget was five hundred pounds a week. I was getting paid fifty of that. You getting um, paid fifty, yeah. Yeah, uh, working in a warehouse at the same time, to, or uh, you know, to, to sort of make ends meet. And I just had, I, I, you know, I just threw myself into it. It was a real, you know, start work at half eight, finish, go and coach a local team, then go and coach Leatherhead, turn the floodlights off at half ten, paint the walls, all the rest of it. Um, Plays a container, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was, and it was almost, um, all the players were, were fairly local. I thought there was a really nice spirit amongst everyone. We, we weren't in danger of getting promoted, but we we also just had a, you know, a really nice way about, about how we went around things and, and a definitely a connection to the community. So I felt like I was very lucky to be surrounded by people that gave me a grounding in what being in a team who don't have money don't have um, necessarily all the facilities. You, you, you have to fight for everything. You have to struggle, um, and more importantly, you have to respect the fact that the, own, the you know the fans own the club. So yeah. I felt very very privileged <laughs> to one be a part of that, but also I think when I did then take over at Exeter, violating Orient youth team, I felt like albeit on a on a much smaller scale, I'd I'd already had a taste of. Uh, what the environment was and what the club was was all about. Yeah, and it, it it was a good time. It was a good time. I'm going to share some stats. I like stats, right? Okay. And, I, and I've done my research, right? You are the highest win rate manager of Exeter City, according to the history books. I just want you to know that. Uh, 49.44%, actually. That's a little bit harsh to... Our, our present assistant manager, but uh, Kevin Nicholson, if you, li if you listen to this, it was six games and you weren't officially manager, although you were a great manager because we won. He had a 50% rate, but you've had a, a lot more games, right? I know Kevin will laugh at that because uh, he uh, said that on a podcast. So good win rate, uh, 89 games, 44 wins, 16 draws, 29 defeats. Uh, at the time, just to give everybody a picture of the players, and I might get this wrong, so please correct me. You had uh, Chris Todd, Jamie Coppinger, Santos Gaia. I didn't so, have Jamie. No, I didn't have Jamie. I wish I had Jamie Coppinger, but I didn't have him. I wish I did. Ah, okay. Interesting. Thank you for correcting me. And you had some Scott Hiley, Dean Moxie, Sean Devine, Stevie Flack, and players like Andy Taylor. So yeah. come on, you've walked in through the door at Exeter. What was that first day like? Um, I'll be really honest with you. So I think I was, uh, Steve Perriman was there. So he would have been the, the only person that I would have known at the time. Paul Buckle was working as, I think, within the youth. And yes. Paul, I've known for a, you know, our career, sort of like we were the same age. He was at Watford as a kid. Um, he left Watford to go to Brentford and then we sort of like end up playing against each other. So we've, I've always had a connection with, with Box. Um, so I knew him, but Steve was the main link. Um, I think the best thing I can say is that, you know, there was an, I had a real naivety about me. I think that, you know, if, with a bit more gray hair, you probably might look at that situation and think, well, hang on, but the club are 15th in the table. They're a million pound in debt. They can't, they can't, there's a transfer embargo. They can't sign anybody. Yeah. Um, you know, it, the, the you know, money is really tight every single month. The expectation is probably, you know, greater than than the reality of the situation. I think had I been less or more informed or perhaps even 
I, I suppose you, when you're young, you back yourself, you're fearless. And yeah, I I went into it in that way. If you want me to be really honest, I think day one, I was lucky. I think I remember going there and there was a, a natural break. So I think I had seven or eight days leading into the first game, right. um, which was all the shot at home. And I remember feeling more comfortable on the training ground, felt really comfortable in that environment. But as soon as I went to St. James's Park and <laughs> stood out for the first game, I remember thinking, what have I done? I remember for the first 40, you know, 30 minutes, I couldn't see the game. I couldn't read it. Um, really? It took too much for me. I was like, I think I was only 31, 30, 31 years of age. Yeah, something you were like quite that. young. Was it, oh, you, because you retired at, retired at 29, I think. Is that yeah, right? so I had, my, I had my sort of 18 months at Leatherhead and then a little bit, yeah. a bit of time late on. So I think I'd be 31, 32. I think it was just that nearly turning 32 in the November. Yeah. And um, yeah, I remember sort of like watching a game and not being able to, just couldn't read it, couldn't, could not concentrate. Um, and I just thought, what we've done, this is too big for me. And then I suppose, <laughs> you know, I suppose it's forgivable now. At the time, I, I felt less, less so. But it, I think the preparation into the game was good and we ended up scoring and then we scored again. And I think we ended up 3 0 up. And then I think, um, they got one back towards the end. <laughs> so, whilst if you you know being honest, <laughs> I remember it being really all-consuming, a little bit too much in the first game, and then wow. I think it got a lot. Of, it did get a lot easier. And I was, you know, I had Scott Hiley there as an assistant who was brilliant. At, you know, he was playing and assisting. That's where the club was. You had dual roles. You had to have dual roles because yeah. you know that's how things were. Um, and I and I feel very very fortunate to have had Steve Perriman. You know, he's like a, he is my footballing father. He's like a second father to me in terms of the guidance that he's been able to give me. Um, like I say, it wasn't, it wasn't a relationship that started from, from me as a player. It, it, it happened after that, perhaps. But I think what Steve gave the club was credibility. We needed yeah. that. You know, we, we really needed that. We needed someone who could talk on a level to other clubs, who could go into a boardroom and... You know, I think, and speak on behalf of Exeter and give us perhaps the credibility that we hadn't had or perhaps was missing or perhaps, you know, prior to that, you know, I wasn't there. So it's, I was there for a year as a player, but it felt like it was, there were some sideshows going on at times. Um, yeah, 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 it was. And that yeah. the distraction was everything other than the football or the club or the supporters. And I think what Steve was able to do was give us that football credibility back that we really needed. And, he, you know, that aside, he really gave me um the help and the guidance that i needed yeah and i i remember one thing and it's a little thing that yes. uh, and it, this is maybe urban myth but i think this is true and it means a lot and it's about the powdered milk and milk story about <laughs> arriving at the training ground and he, he got, apparently a little urban myth says he got a cup of tea with powdered milk and a little stirrer and he and he immediately turned around and went i've just driven from london uh, I want some nice milk and then I want a spoon and a proper tea bag and stuff. You're going to do this properly, not in a, and, and it's those little things, as you know, that I think sort of sums Steve up a little bit because he yeah. did that. He? he did. And he's not frightened to say as well. And I think he would say in a room, what a lot of people might be thinking, which is important. And you need, yeah. you need people like that on your side, especially when you are, 15th or 16th in the table and a million pound in debt and you can't bring players in you need someone like that who's going to back you yeah. and um that's that's what he was able to do indeed and, let, and let's um go through that season right and I, and you know i'm going to focus in on one bit but there was quite a lot of games uh let's talk about well let's do some of the background fa trophy billericke tamworth Stam stanford in the rain Right, very wet. Ampadu, uh, Mr. Ampadu got the um, the goal. Yeah, won yeah. it. I was there getting soaking wet that day. Um, FA Cup run. We know we're going to talk about it. Braintree starts to build. Two nil. Grimsby one nil. And uh, uh, they were in the league. We were non-league at the time. Yeah. Uh, I'll be forever grateful because one of my friends is a Doncaster Rovers season ticket holder for. The Doncaster game, the happy as Larry goal, the Moxie, right? And then you're sat 
in a room just like we were all the other day when Middlesbrough came out the hat for Exeter and we yeah. are in four games from Europe if we keep going just to let you know we'll come and join us yeah yeah please let that happen but there you go you're in that you're on that sofa I've got the I've still got the newspaper in in my garage I've got every newspaper from uh the, those couple of days so what's going through your mind when that ball or just before that ball comes out when the ball comes out etc well I will answer that but let me rewind one game quick if you cool. if you don't mind the Doncaster game so the irony is now I work at Liverpool and our under 18 physio is Greg Blundell. Right, yes. Greg scored Doncaster's in the goal in there. Yeah. And every now and again, I take real pleasure in reminding him that he was the one that I think we picked out before the game was come on, we stop him. You know, we're for sure great. there's lots of new players. They were you know, two divisions above us, I think, two, something like that, two or three divisions right. above us at the time. So um, I take real pleasure in reminding him on a sort of fairly regular basis that that could have been them and it could have been him at Old Trafford. Um, and, and can I just say at this point, because I'm going to share this with a guy called Mr Miller, I, this this section was for you. Uh, so we, we've beaten Doncaster, right? You're sat on that sofa. What are you thinking what, when that happened? Well, I was actually around <laughs> Stephen, Julian Tag, and a few of the others were, were all, I think we're all in the same room. Um, it was actually, I think, being filmed, or I think that I seem to remember there being some cameras or something there that because there were photographers there as well. Because there's a really yeah, good were, picture yeah. of like arms in the air when the, when the. I remember when Man United came out. There was a little bit of me that just thought, "Oh, what if?" But never really expecting it to. And um, yeah. yeah, indescribable, really. I suppose the first the first thing you think is, "Wow, it's like all our Christmases have come at once," and then. I suppose I remember driving back thinking we've actually got to play the game now. And the worst thing that you you know in the back of your mind you're thinking, yeah. you know, we're a we are a conference team and we're playing against Man United who at the time were the all conquering force domestically and across Europe that they were. So you're actually thinking, well, you know, this is great, but actually I'm the one that's got I'm responsible for the result here. And um I was quite proud, I, I was, you know course proud of the performance that goes without saying but I was actually more proud of the players and the staff and the club around how they were prior to the performance and afterwards I thought I thought it wasn't just about I, don't, I think the result was, was great of course players were, were unbelievable but I thought it in how we did it was the bit that was the most important for me it was that there wasn't anything loose in the papers about what we were going to do. There were no daft stories around, you know, there was nothing but respect for Man United. I think we were seen as a very proper club. I don't know we were by Sir Alex Ferguson who spoke after, you know, I had a, um, fortunate enough to have time with him after the game. And I think that the thing that came through is we'd done it really respectfully. And um, I felt that was what we needed as, as a club at that time. It was almost to be taken seriously again. Yeah. And, um, Gosh, did you do it? Say, I mean, you you probably would have. Well, you probably won't have understood the, uh, um, you know, Stafford Services being blocked up with uh, a, a fifty to hundred extra coaches. Uh, you, you know, me on a um, putting a minibus together up the M6 and coming off the M6 toll up onto the M6 and just seeing a wall of extra fans. And you know, there was that expectation there. Um, what, what did you say in your team talk? beforehand can you remember yeah um, well, I remember at the hotel we I spot I just I think we, we made a couple of really good decisions um, one was to go to the ground the day before and the sort of sightseeing and the tourist you know not feeling like a tourist that was that was already taken care of we then trained at Bolton's uh, training ground so I felt that we had a really good lead into it and it was very much the messaging was well we want to get a result here and we can get a result here but we can't do it if we're there just as tourists we've got to go as you know we've got yeah. to go to to be our best and if we are our best and perhaps they're not at their best then let's see i felt that we had um a really nice game plan so i was keen that it looked as close to a conference game as it could for as long as it could and by that i just meant that you know probably we felt comfortable competing for second balls we felt comfortable if it wasn't a game where you had to have 
maximum control. You know, we knew that wasn't really what we were good at, but we also knew that that might not last for very long. And then at some point we'd have to become quite compact and be actually content. The biggest concern I felt we had is when we had the ball, because obviously that's when you look to open up a little bit and yeah. more than adept at catching on the counter attack. So I felt we'd already had a lot of sort of like team meetings at the hotel or unit meetings at the hotel. And I think everyone was clear on their roles and responsibilities. So I don't think in the end, you know, some, some games you feel like you need to get people up for it. So I guess you have to try and find words that you yeah. think will motivate that of course in here it was more about making sure that you know the anxiety and the, and the tension wasn't too great the warm-up wasn't very good um i remember i remember that wasn't particular i remember sort of like just thinking okay well it's, it's nerves we're all nervous and yeah. then the game started and it was quite calm really because i felt they never got close to our goal um we had young Paul Jones in goal, and I'd worked with him at Leighton Orient. So the you know, this sort of like ridiculousness of it all—he was on work experience. So there he is, nineteen years of age, playing, playing in goal at Exeter on work experience. Because we can't actually have um, we were on transfer embargo. The only way you could do it couldn't take a loan, couldn't take anyone else. You had to do it, you know. Yeah. So, so he he was on a youth contract. Um, and, but you know what? Never got close to his goal in the times, and he, he I just felt that we grew with every minute that passed yeah it became you know it became sort of a little bit more comfortable we we settled into things quite quickly um, yeah and then half you know from memory half time came and went and i suppose that's when you knew that the second half would, would feel a little bit longer because they were likely to make changes they'd they'd put <laughs> i think they've shown us the respect of playing some really good players um yeah. But they'd also, of course, decided to rest a few. And you know, I think at one point they brought on, I think, the Wednesday. They, they certainly brought on Ronaldo. I remember that one. Okay. Skulls. Alan, Skulls. Um, yeah. Alan Smith, I think, started yeah. or yeah. played. Um, Philip Neville played and PK. Yeah, played. yeah, PK. PK played. So it wasn't it wasn't the worst team, <laughs> um, but. You know, we, I never, I never ever had the feeling that we rode our luck. I never, never once looked at the game and thought we need to get lucky here. Yeah. I felt it was about concentration and the players magnificent, staff magnificent. And most importantly, I thought the supporters were magnificent. I thought they, 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 they definitely were the, um, the 12th. It, it, it was a little bit odd. And just to share, I got into a lot of trouble that day because, um, my, um wife is due to give birth at any moment and uh -huh. i actually, uh, actually went to the game so i spent the whole match looking at my phone <laughs> looking at the scoreboard watching the game yeah. and yeah uh, that that second half as you put it was a very long one and there was also a crazy amount of weather as well wasn't it? i think we had yeah, a game so well, when did you maybe come uh just after the replay actually oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm glad you managed to arrange that well for you. Yeah, she's she's gone off to university now. My God, how old am I? Uh, yeah. How old are we? Um, right. So, yeah, the impact of that, right, in terms of your management, we missed out on the playoffs by one point, didn't we? Uh, at that time, which yeah. would have been a bit of a killer, but that was probably just the volume of games and the squad we had at the time. Yeah, I think we we've had to be pretty much faultless. The whole way you know leading into the run-up because we you know when it came in i remember we were we were playing catch-up um we needed to play catch-up and i think that i remember one game i thought was fairly pivotal i think we lost to northwich um i think ball bounced over and i was kicking myself afterwards because i meant to mention to the to the players about when they're passing the ball back don't pass in the frame of the goal pass left pass right a bit um, goalkeeper makes slightly better angle but don't pass back because it was at that stage of the season you know that sort of towards the end of the season when the pitch has yeah. become a little bit rutted or you know not yeah. quite so true and um i think we lost the game three two you know and we but we we battled and i think we we needed to win the last few and we did we were, i think we won our last three games i think a member away at carlisle was the last one one two now yeah now i don't think we could have done anything more than we did in that season i think the players literally gave everything that they had um and i think the supporters did as well you know i think it would have been 
an incredible achievement have we managed to you know sneak in but um i don't i honestly don't have any regrets about that season i'm not sure we could have done an awful lot more than what we than what we did no it's a great season i've got a random question which is coming from one of the researchers have you still got the depeche mode styles coat that you wore at old trafford and what was <laughs> And what was the first comment you said to Alex Ferguson? Like, sorry, or <laughs> but... do you know what? That coat was really I. I know. I mean, you remember I, I wore a tracksuit everywhere, and I kind of thought, well, on this day, I always do the warm up. Um, yeah. But the occasion felt like I should probably. I suppose I didn't want to. I didn't want to be stood next to Alex Ferguson looking like a scruff. So I thought I better wear a suit. I then went to man. The morning I woke up, I remember thinking it's absolutely lashing down with rain here. So I went off to a, I remember going for a walk and buying myself a coat, first shop I found. It was like, really? I, can't, I can't even begin to tell you, I can't remember. So I, just, I bought a coat. Um, and yeah, so that, that's the story of, <laughs> that, that, that's how the coat came out. It wasn't very well planned. And then, um, do you know what, Sir Alex was, was really, really good. Really good. Um, yeah. Gave me more time than I probably deserved afterwards. Um, I think he was just a little bit annoyed. I think they planned a trip away, and then obviously because of the replay, yeah, that probably support that before their their Champions League game against AC Milan. So I think there was a little bit around that, but he was absolutely brilliant. Real, I mean, you'd expect me to say it, but it is true. I thought he was a real class act. He he could have made excuses not to be there. He could have made excuses to sort of like say hello, thank you, and then get out. Um, yeah, but across both games, I thought. Him and his staff were, were every, everything that you would have hoped Manchester United and Alex Ferguson would have been, and probably a little bit more as well. I mean, I, I think we made £835,638 out of that first game. Mm -hmm. uh, something along those figures, to, trust me. Uh, and, and it did make a difference. But uh, we're very grateful to Alex for making a European game because obviously people needed to attend and there were 67,000 there. So you've had a great season, right? Yeah. Um, and then you, you, you got um, some interest from Spurs. Is that right? Moved off to Spurs. Well, I think started the next season. <laughs> and do you know what I mean? Again, I think, you know, you. I, I don't think you or anyone watching this would, would probably appreciate it if I was anything other than honest from my perspective of how it was. I remember getting to the end of the season and thinking, I, I love the lads. I probably wasn't enjoying watching us play. I thought we were hard to beat, really honest. Um, I suppose I always wanted to play a slightly more expansive style of football. I thought we had to go through a period where other other players started to come in <laughs> who I thought would, would help take us to, to somewhere where we wanted to go. So I think um, Matty Gill, uh, yeah. Jamie Mackey I'd signed, um, Adam Stansfield I'd just signed, um, along with a couple of others. And then, I suppose, had a little bit of an epiphany. I, I, I think um, had the opportunity to move to uh, MK Dons and flirted with that one for a while. But the truth is, I think I was starting to learn from mistakes. I knew there was something else out there. I knew that there was a better style of football. I loved watching football for sure, but I didn't really know how to coach it. And um, me going to uh, to Tottenham was probably, you know, whilst at the time people might have thought that you know, lacked ambition or whatever else, but I think in my heart of hearts, I knew I was lacking and I needed a, a, a idea for me. And I described, <clears throat> I described going to, to Tottenham as a bit like going to, to Harvard. You know, for, it, was a, it was a football education that I needed. Yeah. I've never played at the top level. <clears throat> I've never coached at the top level. So whilst I had this idea about how I believe football should be played, I didn't really have much of an idea of how to work or coach it. And I just felt like I needed to be honest with myself and go back to school. And yeah. I think retrospectively, it was the best decision that I took. Um, you know, I don't think it, I can understand why it might have looked like I lacked ambition. But for me, I, I just knew, I knew that I didn't know. I knew that I knew there was more out there. And I think going into an environment where I could watch the likes of Martin Yole or Chris Hewton, John McDermott or Chris Ramsey. Um, you know, through my yeah. time there, there was like so many, like Harry Redknapp or Juan de Ramos, yeah. um, Andre Villaboas. I was very lucky to spend a, a time there and work with sometimes, you know, I was lucky enough to work with the Modric's or the Gareth Bales or Berbatov. Yeah. And I think that gave me um, 
an insight as to as to perhaps what I did need to learn and what I did need to do. And so, you know, and, and, and you know, I've not left that pathway. So I guess I could have decided to go back into management. But the truth is, I've really enjoyed developing players, and that's been my passion and remains my passion. So yeah. Hopefully, I get the opportunity to continue to do that for a while longer. But uh, again, football's about pathways, uh, and uh, I don't. Well, I personally don't think that you know anybody looks back and thinks of oh, your bottle being a uh, football manager. I don't think that comes out in any shape or form. So, um, but it's interesting you talk about academies. Now, I have watched a couple of podcasts uh, where you talk about academies. As you know, Exeter's academy is doing really, really well. Uh, thanks partly to the Ollie Watkins money and obviously the pathway. He's yeah. on his way playing for England, doing really well. There's so many other players that have come through. We've got a £3 million training ground. But what you touched on at the start was you start at the Cubs, right? Then it was done by a letter and you got into Watford, right? Which I didn't realise the team you supported, but I get that now. So, and it has changed from centre of excellence is where you go in uh maybe a, a couple of times a week whereas the academy you spend a, you're within a, a, a structure and you can't um play for other teams etc where do you where, where do you see it working in football now i know the england dna and all that's come through over the last 15 20 years um what do you think of academies and centre of excellences as models Wow, um, it's a big subject. I think I'd start off with Exeter's, who I think is excellent. So I think um, you forget how long it's been, but I'm sure that the Exeter City supporters haven't and wouldn't have forgotten the great work that Eamon Dolan did in terms of wow. setting up an academy at a very difficult time and I think having this real belief in, in the youth there. So I think it will be really um, foolish to think that you know, an awful lot of the, the rewards Exeter have reaped over the years in, in the many of the, the unbelievable players that they've that they've produced probably wasn't um put in without you know that that was that was Eamon's work in the and and, and Raddy, of course, because yeah. Raddy was never present back in the time. So I think you know an awful lot of good work was done with very little resources. And um, no surprise that they've reaped the benefits of that. I certainly was a beneficiary of it as a manager with the likes of you know, Dean Moxie being in there and um, uh, well, okay. the goes on, yeah, George and all the rest of them. So I was very lucky that, um, that I was the beneficiary of that. But I think, you know, I think that's the beauty of academies. You can have someone like Exeter and you can produce Premier League players and Champions League players in that way. Um, and there's, you know, if, if there's no guarantee that if you spend tens of million pounds more and he comes to Liverpool that you're going to be necessarily any more, you know, successful. Um, yeah. I think it has to be, if you're, if you're at an academy and you're a child or a parent, it's got to be what, what you feel is the best fit for you. Some, I have no doubt in my mind that, you know, if I look at myself, Liverpool would have been too big for me. There's no way I would have come through at Liverpool because I think the badge, you know, the badge would have probably weighed a bit too heavy on me as a lad. I needed to feel like I was in the top third of a group or I needed to feel like I had a chance. And so for me, Watford would, would have been a far better fit. Um, it's, yeah. I think that you're very lucky now in England that you have, you know, you have the choice of an awful lot of academies. And, you know, I, I think they'll, they'll all be, I think now the way everything is regulated, I think they'd all be um, excellent in their own way. It really is just a case of what fits you, you know, and... Um, like I say, I think that if you look at the productivity of Exeter over the, over recent years, it's you know it's as good as anyone's. And and we need to keep it going, but um, definitely. And uh, and I, one thing I picked up from another podcast you did, and we all know roughly the facts: zero point zero zero one percent or whatever of uh, players get through. So I also heard that you talked about loan signings. And by the way, we've never had any loan signings. I'm going to say from Liverpool that I can remember. For a while, hint, hint. Uh, you you talked about uh, a player learnt more in five or six games on a loan, playing in the lower league, shall we say, rather than th three months in an academy. I think I got that right. Do you, where do you see loan signings at the moment in terms of football? <laughs> I think you know. I think you have to look at um, back 
back in the day when I was younger, the reserve team was was your reserve team. So it was yeah. filled with players that weren't getting into your first team and you were playing against teams who were, who were something similar. Um, I think now the reserve team has been sort of reabsorbed by that you've got the first team, then you've got the, the squad that are probably going to play in maybe some of the other games, maybe not the Premier League games or Champions League games. You then got a group out that's on loan. So actually your next tier down is probably your fourth team is your 21s. Um, and right. the average age of that is usually 18.94, something like that, 19 years of age every year. So what you are going to need as a player at some point is numbers next to your name. You are going to need to suggest to a manager that you can cope or that you can play in a senior game. There's no doubt about it that um, academy football can be sometimes different. Um, I, I do believe it prepares you for the real world, but it prepares you in a slightly different way. But at some yeah. point, you're going to need to suggest to someone who's going to pick a team sheet on a, on a Saturday that you're ready for it or you can be trusted with his job. And, yeah. and for a kid to do that, that's 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 really, really tough. It's certainly tough to do at a place like Liverpool where you know, you, you're expected to go in and take the place of Mo Salah or Virgil van Dijk. That's a big ask for someone. Um, yeah, of course. And we've got examples of where that has happened. Curtis Jones or Trent would have been able to go in without a loan, but sometimes you also need people to go in and go and get, you know, 40, you know, I, I always think that you know where a player is when they get to 100 games. I think you're, it's, it's hard to judge someone before that. I think once you get to 100 games or at Liverpool, if you have two seasons as a starter, I'll call you a first team player. You know, so I think, right. you know, you've got to be prepared to, you know, and sometimes your first loan isn't where you want to go. You know, I think uh, when I was at Tottenham, I think Troy Archibald Henville came to Exeter. Um, yes. And at the time, in the same sim, in around that sort of era, I guess. Harry Kane would have been in the youth team and Ryan Mason and Andros Townsend yeah. and Danny Rose. But at the time, it's easy to say now, oh, no one wanted these players. But for a first loan, it's a big risk. And the Harry Kane that you get at 18 isn't the Harry Kane that you're going to get at 28. It's obvious, you know, Harry is so yeah. much better, 10 years more experienced. So sometimes I think that clubs need to take a bit of a leap of faith and, um, and, and you know, but... I also understand that it's a manager's job. You know, I've been on both sides of this, and you know, you, when you're putting eleven out, I suppose you are trusting eleven people with your job <laughs> as much as anything else. And so, I understand that a lot of managers will go with experience and league appearances because it's a safer option. Um, yeah, our job is to see if there, if we can create opportunities, and if we can create opportunities, I genuinely believe that there are players that will go on to flourish. Yeah, definitely. And uh, it's interesting because even, even at uh, lower tiers, so like AFC Totten did a podcast interview with uh, Jimmy Ball and he uh, we talked about loans, etc. And he said, I need to have the right sort of player to come into my league because yes. it's a ma man's game and somebody's paying for their mortgage uh, and uh, they'll do the, you know, the um, dirty side of football, shall we say. So, no, it's interesting. So, you say you haven't been down to Exeter I, I, uh, for a little while. Um, uh, I don't think you mentioned in the, um, I think we were off camera when we spoke. You have been down a couple of times, I think. You came down for a game and Adam Stansfield's funeral. Was that right? Did I get that yeah. right? I mean, it's, 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 it's fairly all consuming, you know, sort of, and it's uh, in terms of football. And you can get lost in it and, you know, you, you end up thinking of your years and seasons rather than actual years and you know especially if you're on courses or whatever else you're doing so you a lot of time goes quickly but i think the last unfortunately the last time i was in exeter i think there might be been Flagler Stansfield's um funeral and then prior to that i remember going down we had stephen corker on loan at yeovil ryan mason on loan at yeovil and yep. lost uh, uh, troy at exeter so i remember sort of watching a few games around that time um and the thing that i you know I've, you know, I've, I've always loved Exeter as a city, and if I ever have to describe it to people, I, I, you know, I sort of like find myself waxing lyrical about how beautiful it is and the surrounding area. Um, and the thing that took me back the last time I was there was just the sort of like the way that the actual city itself had developed and how I, you know, struggled to recognise it from the the time I was there as a manager. And I'm guessing yeah. that's gone again. But the thing that's a constant is the, you know, it's just the you know, the beauty of the surrounding area, the coastline, the you know, yeah. sort of the 
Uh, and, 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 and the greenery and the, and the just the, the sort of like the endless amount of woodland and fields is uh, it is a, a, a genuine it's a hidden gem and and as mark cooper said on a couple of podcasts ago yeah, exeter's now got an ikea uh, i'm not advertising ikea but it because it, uh, it was similar conversation he said uh you know it, and, and the whole area is growing which is helping us so uh you know we, we are a you know a, a a league one football club now and a building and i'm gonna say because i'm conscious of your time because you were um uh on the clock a little bit um uh, i wanted to do this interview and it took me six to nine months to get your telephone number and I, i'm not gonna share oh, yes. how i got that number but i will say thank you to the person that gave it to me right but i also wanted to just say uh from a lot of extra fans uh, they were like can you get alex single for pod right um, oh, wow. well, and i did it i did it there's a lot of people that wanted to get you on this podcast uh and the reasons for that being you've talked about Eamon, right you've talked about the chaos that ensued when you, you came to exeter uh that period of time that you uh, at the helm right you gave us a little bit of pride back you and steve started to put the right things in place and we 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 are forever grateful for that i'm going to say that now as a fan right and thank you for doing what you did and for the younger fans that aren't aware right go back through the history because uh, we do own our football club but we wouldn't have owned our football club if it hadn't been for um alex inglethorpe on this screen here getting a uh, useful draw at manchester united and having an excellent cup run say so, um, i was really kind of you to say that thank you um i, want, I wanted to say thank you yeah no so. it really means a lot to me i must admit i sort of um i, I don't get the chance to speak about exeter very often i mean I, you know why would i guess because <laughs> about youth development or tottenham or, or liverpool or whatever else it's been but you know this has been really good for me because i haven't had to think of exeter in that way in that detail for a long time and when i do i only i find myself smiling you know, I think yeah. I, perspective is, is wonderful in life and I, you know, I'm 51 years of age now and it's probably only now that I realise one, one unbelievable opportunity I was given at such a young age. They had no right to take a, a gamble on me. Um, Steve, Julian had no right to pick me from Leighton Orient's youth team and offer me a first team job like that. So I think it was incredibly brave um, and I think you know, to sort of like being put in that situation where we couldn't sign players or we couldn't, um, it, it felt like us against the world. It, it felt a little bit like we, you know, we had to, we, all we had was the players that were in at the cat and fiddle, you know, the, the supporters were on board, everyone was on board. So, you know, I look back with perspective now and think not only was I um, incredibly lucky to be a part of Exeter's, you know, Exeter's history at that time, but uh, incredibly lucky to be a part of, you know, the, the people, the fans, all the rest of it at that time as well. I think it was a unique, you know, it was, it was a unique period in the club's history. And um, I think the subsequent managers of Paul Tisdale, whoever has been in, in, in situ, have taken the club to where it needs to go. And, and hopefully that will continue and um, you know, continue to thrive and do well. So I wish everyone in Exeter all the very best. And thank you for the opportunity to speak about it. Uh, absolute pleasure for me. That's why I do the, this uh, podcast. And uh, I can remember Northwich home in a way. And uh, uh, let's just say we've got the uh, nice surprise of Middlesbrough in the Cup in a couple of Tuesday nights. We'll see how we get on. Uh, yeah. we've now, we're now amazingly having uh, games postponed because we've got three international players uh, in the squad. Um, we we've moved on and thank you for what you did really appreciate it thanks for coming on the podcast no have a good day thank you thank you